First of all, in the book of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah and chapter 53, and we commence at verse 1. <clears throat> who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And then if we could turn over, please, to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews and uh, chapter 12. Verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May the Lord bless his word to each and every one of our hearts this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 is a tremendous chapter of those who walked by faith, who lived by faith, who served God, a great cloud 
of witnesses. And the writer to the Hebrews then goes on and he says, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He says they are looking down at us as in a great arena. They are looking down upon us. And then he says these words. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And now he diverts the attention to you and to me. Running the race. Compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses who have finished their course, who have run the race. They look down upon us. And the exhortation that is given to us here is this. We are to lay aside every weight. And no doubt the apostle here is reminding us of the athletic and the sports world, those who run the race have got to take off and lay aside every weight, the thing or things that would hinder their progress, that would restrain them, that would keep them back. And he says, we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which would so easily beset us, that which would entangle us and entangle us so easily. And we have got to pay attention as to how we run the race for God. This morning, this is a race in which every Christian, every child of God, is and should be involved in. How are we running this morning? What is the progress that we have made in our race? And we make that progress by a continual looking at our lives in order that we might identify the weight, the hindrance, the thing or the person that would restrain our progress with God and also examine our lives so that we might identify the sin that would entangle us and would keep us back, would hinder us. And so the apostle, after mentioning those practical things, he says we are to look on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are to look at him, we are to keep our eyes firmly fixed upon him. Isn't it true that as we run the race for God, sometimes we focus our eyes upon individuals? And in doing so, we possibly become discouraged but we're not to look at individuals in that sense of the word. We are to look on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then he goes on to say, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we look at the Savior, as we run the race, 
the central theme that should occupy our mind is the cross of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about a wooden structure. We're talking about the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've already quoted this morning. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The preaching of the cross is to those who are lost. Foolishness. No longer applicable. Out of date. And that is indeed the picture that is facing us today. The preaching of the cross is old fashioned. No longer needed from the pulpit. And not only is this a statement by many, but this is something that's being carried out by many. The cross of Christ. But brothers and sisters this morning, never ever, lose, never ever let us lose sight of the glory of the cross. Because the writer here says, looking on to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. The cross of Christ is important, not only in our preaching, but in our personal lives. If we lose sight of the cross of Christ, of the death of Christ, in our personal lives, and in our race for God, if we lose sight of that, we lose our way. We lose our way. Because there is so much involved in the cross work of Jesus Christ. And I tell you this morning that when we look unto him and when we focus upon his death and when we learn from the cross, it spurs us on, it should spur us on. It should fire us up. It should fill our hearts with enthusiasm because brothers and sisters this morning, I feel that when we lose out on the meaning of the cross, we lose out in our progress with God. We lose out in our progress with God. If the only thing that occupies our mind as we travel along life's road and engage in the cross of Christ, if the only thing that occupies our mind is I'm saved, I'm a Christian, and I'm on my way to heaven. I say to you kindly this morning, we're making no progress in our Christian life. We're making no progress. We just become self-centered, only thinking about ourselves. But the cross of Christ focuses our attention upon what he has done. Who for the joy that was set before him. The Savior could see beyond the cross. The Savior could see beyond the things that we're going to look at in a moment. See beyond it. There was a joy that lay before the Son of God. And in order that that joy might be fulfilled, he endured the cross and despised the shame. What do we read? What do we learn? What is the significance of our Savior enduring the cross? I want us this morning just to look at a few things. A few things that we are familiar with. But sometimes when we, were, we, when we are familiar with something, we can also become forgetful of some things. And the Word of God says, knowing the frailty of the human mind, the Word of God says that we are to stir up our pure minds 
by way of remembrance. The sorrow of the cross. He endured the cross. What was going to happen? What the Savior was going to experience is something that we need to remind ourselves of. Book of Isaiah, chapter 53. We're reading it there. Verse 3, it says, He is despised, rejected of man, a man of sorrows. Man of sorrows. Can you imagine that? One who spent much time in alleviating the pain of others. One who was concerned about the personal circumstances of others. One who brought light where there was darkness. One who brought hope where there was despair. One who brought healing where there was sickness. But he was also a man of sorrows. They take him. Though they could find no fault in him. Though false witnesses were rounded up. There was no evidence to condemn him. And yet he was nailed upon the cross. And on that cross the Son of God was filled with sorrow, despised, rejected by men. Can you imagine the sorrow that must have filled his heart? When just prior to the cross, he heard one of his disciples, one of his trusted disciples, blaspheming and denying that he knew Jesus Christ. And the Savior went to the cross and was hanging on the cross knowing that Peter had denied him. Can you imagine, can I understand the sorrow that must have filled his heart when, as we read in the Scripture, that all his disciples forsook him and they fled can we bring it down to a human perspective? Can we bring it down to a personal experience? Do we know what it is when we have trusted friends and somehow or other when we need them most, they disappear? They're not to be seen. They're away. And you and I can understand the sorrow and the pain that, that fills our mind and our heart when that happens. And it happened to the Son of God. They forsook him. As he hangs upon the cross, he cries out in the midst of the darkness, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Forsaken there upon the cross. And oh, that we can enter into the depth of this experience which the Savior experienced the sorrow of the cross. Who for the joy that was set before him endured that? For you, for me. Sorrow of the cross, the sufferings of the cross. He was Wounded. He was bruised. And the prophet pictures it here as one not only rejected by men, not only a man of sorrows, but a man who suffered. I think all of us understand the meaning of suffering. 
to some degree or other. When these physical bodies of ours have been affected by sickness, when we do know what it is to have pain and suffering, you know and I know the anguish. Friend, let me say this morning, none of us know the extent of the sufferings of Christ. He was wounded. And he was wounded by evil, sinful men. I can't understand the pain, the suffering of a crown of thorns being pushed into my brow. I can't understand the pain of a back that has been lashed and left like a furrowed field. I can't understand the pain and the suffering of the nails pierced into his hands and into his feet and a spear put into his side. I can't understand it. But the Son of Man, the Son of God, endured the cross. And that suffering, dear friend, in this meeting this morning, that suffering was for you and for me. How can I stand idly by? How can I stand untouched? How can I stand back and say, it doesn't concern me? Oh, my brother, my sister, this morning, he suffered alone upon the cross. And the sorrow of the cross, the suffering of the cross, the shame of the cross. Maybe sometimes we don't really appreciate it, but the cross was a death that was reserved for the most heinous crimes, for the criminals. Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. The shame of dying upon a cross. He became obedient unto death, Paul said, writing to the Philippians. Even the death of the cross. That plumbed the very depths of shame. The death of the cross. <coughs> Stripped of his raiment. Hanging as a spectacle for all to see. The shame of the cross. And friends, this morning, he endured the cross. For who? For you. For me. For every one of us. Is it any wonder that when the apostle is talking about us making progress in our Christian walk, is it any wonder when he talks about running the race that he says if we're going to run the race, if we're going to make progress with God, it is as we focus our mind upon Christ who endured the cross, the shame of the cross. But you know, we're also reminded 
of his sin bearing upon the cross. Peter says, who his own self. Listen to it. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body upon the tree. Whose sins? My sin. My iniquity. Because when he was wounded, he was wounded for my transgressions. And when he was bruised, he was bruised for my iniquity. May I emphasize it, and I trust may the Holy Spirit of God engrave it upon my mind and upon my heart this morning. He bore my sin in his own body upon the tree. God turned aside because God laid upon him my iniquity. God deliberately, knowing what was involved, put the judgment that should have been mine was placed upon the lovely Son of God at the cross. Sin bearing. Friend, if there's anything that spurs me on, if there's anything that should fill my life and my heart with enthusiasm, if there's anything that makes me make progress in my run with God, it's the fact that as I look upon Christ, I look upon one who loved me and gave himself for me. On that cross, sorrow, suffering, shame, sin bearing. But you know, as we go on down the chapter, we read these words. Verse 11, he shall see of the travail of a soul and he shall be satisfied. I tell you this morning, as I look at Christ, as I look at the cross this morning, I see satisfaction. What did he cry? It is finished. What nobody else could do. What no offering could ever do. Christ made one sacrifice for sin forever. And he sat down. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. What is that joy? My dear friend, that joy is that he sat down in heaven at the right hand of the majesty and high, a prince and a savior forever. Satisfied. He satisfied what God required to take away sin. He said it's finished. And God raised him from the dead and sat him at his own right hand. As I look to Christ this morning, as I think about the cross, enduring the cross, I go beyond and I see my Savior there at the Father's right hand. And he says, I want you to run the race with patience. I want you to keep going. 
I want you to make progress. For as you view the cross, you see what I've accomplished. And I'm at the right hand of the Father this day. And I'm there to help you. Because I'm your great high priest. I'm there because I know the difficulties that you face. Because I've been there. I know the temptations that will come your way. Because I've been there. And because I've been there. And I understand. I'm there to give you help. Hallelujah. We don't travel alone. Praise God this morning. We don't have to face the difficulties on the race of life alone. Because we see at the right hand of the Father this day. Him. Who for the joy that was set before. Endured the cross. Why did he endure the cross? That he might bring many sons to glory. What a hope we have this morning. What a blessed hope. He's bringing us to glory. As I close... I want to ask myself a question. And I would, if I may, ask you a question. What progress have you made from January 2007 to 2008? What progress have you made in the race that is set before us. Are you going on with God? Or as I talk to you this morning, is God's Holy Spirit identifying a weight that's holding you back? I could mention a hundred things and not one of them would be applicable to you. You know and I know. What is the weight that's holding you back? And if you can identify it this morning, I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I right? Is this what God wants me to do? God's maybe saying to you this morning, I want you now to lay it aside. Put it to the one side. What is it that entangles you? What is it that trips you up? What is it that impedes your progress? Is God saying to us this morning, I want you to lay aside that besetting sin. I want you to start to run again. And if I need the impetus to make me run, I just stand beneath the cross. See the sorrow upon the face of the lovely Son of God. To see the suffering. To see the shame. To see my sin upon the Savior. And to know that for the joy that was set before him, he endured it. We come around this table, brother and sister, this morning, God forbid us. God forgive us. 
that if we make this just a habit and if we just casually put our hand out and take a piece of bread, lift the cup. Jesus said, when you do this, you remember me. He said, this bread, it speaks of my body that was broken. The contents of this cup tell you about my blood that was shed. And I take it this morning. I say, Lord, thank you. I'm going to run better for you. I'm going to be enthusiastic in my service. Lord, I'm going to devote more of my time in serving you. For he deserves it.